Yes, welcome to Declaration of the Descent. And okay, there's a few more people coming logging on. I'll just I'll let them log on first before we kick off. Yes, everybody's decided to log on. Ah, oh, good morning from Massachusetts. Hello. I was going to say, um, if anybody who's tuning in from the states, please. Feel free to say hello on, on on chat and tell us where you're from. Anyway, happy Fourth of July, and a, a big a big welcome to anybody um, who's joining us stateside, um, and also anybody here in, in in Northern Ireland, and indeed wherever you are in the world. And we're operating on many time zones. Um, this is um, welcome to the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. Um, today's presentation is. Declaration and Dissent, and it's to mark um, the, 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 the 4th of July and Ulster's contribution to, um, to, to basically um, the creation of America. So today we've got two speakers. Um, the first speaker is Mark Thompson, former chair of the Ulster Scots Agency, a regular contributor to the BBC, but more importantly than any of that, he also curated our latest exhibition, which is on site um, in Prony, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, uh, just a few housekeeping notices. Um, you've all been muted on entry, and that's so that we, um, that the speakers, we can hear them uninterrupted. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Um, so please write any questions as the talks go along, um, and we will um, add them. Add them to chat, and we'll um, ask, we'll come to them at the end. Sorry, I forgot to say the second speaker. This our second speaker is Brett Irwin, um, who's a Crony member of staff, and Brett's done a lot of work in digging out um, the records that relate to the Revolutionary War um, in America. Sorry, Brett. Um, the I should say to um, to that we are recording today's presentations, and we will put them up on the. His YouTube channel in due course. Um, the I mentioned our latest exhibition. Our latest exhibition is Ulster Scots um, and the Declaration of Independence, and it's got one document which we have all known from the National Archives in London, and that's a copy of the declar original Declaration itself. It's one of about twenty what I call the Dunlap. Um, copies which were all emanate to to back to to the same time, and Mark will be talking to you about the deck that the, the, the our dead lab um, exhibit. So that's available to view in Prony for the rest of the month, and we're actually looking to extend that into August. So anybody um, who's passing, Prony is open Monday to Friday, so feel free to drop in and have a look at the exhibition and the Declaration of Independence. I should say this is part of. Um, What's called Pony 100, which is a um, Pony is a, a hundred this year. In fact, we were a hundred about a fortnight ago, and, and we're using the whole year um, as an as an opportunity to promote um, Pony. Um, so it's, I, that's all I'm going to say today. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. I hope everybody here is looking forward to it, and everybody in the US. So I'm going to pass over to Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, good good afternoon, everyone, or, or good morning, everyone, perhaps, depending on where you are. I can see my friend from Maine, Mary, in the, in the top corner here. So we are indeed transatlantic kinfolk, and that's an expression that, that we have started to use more and more regularly here, because as we, as we allow the, the internet to connect us together, we understand so much more about what has bound us together in the past, and hopefully we'll continue to do that more so in the future. And as, as Stephen said, I had the, the great pleasure of uh, designing and creating the new exhibition, which is in the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland in Belfast. And, and it is called uh, Ulster Scots and the Declaration of Independence. Um, we have had 250 years almost of, of history and subsequent events, which have layered up on top of those great years. And sometimes it can be a wee bit difficult perhaps for us to, to look back with a clear view to really get an idea of what was happening in those times. 
But there are so many other documents which preceded the Declaration itself and which fed into the shaping of the philosophy that it captured so very well. And I am surrounded here by various books and things like that that I want to show you all today. So I'm going to screen share from time to time with some of the, the graphical examples from the exhibition and also two audio clips because we are literally going to bring back the two names, two of the three names on the declaration. We're going to bring them back to life so you can hear them speaking about themselves and, and what they did in June and July of 1776. Now, many of you, I imagine, are very well read and you understand the connection between Ulster and America very well. Um, a few of the, the, the books that I've come to, to really enjoy in my um, studies are, for example, Henry Jones Ford, uh, The Scotch-Irish in America, I think from 1905. You can probably get that free online. A tremendous amount of information. Around a few, a few years later than that, um, this book was published. Again, I hope you can see it. The Scot in America and the Ulster Scot. It was written by Whitelaw Reed, who was the U.S. ambassador to Britain at the time. He, he toured um, Scotland and Ulster and gave this lecture. His grandparents had come from Ulster and went to America, and he became a very influential newspaper owner and ran as vice president at one point. So these ideas uh, of how we connect have been published many, many times over the years. During uh, the... World War II period, of course, and this very famous book by the Reverend W.F. Marshall, Ulster Sales West, was published. It's a, it's a slim little volume, but came out around 1942, I believe. But these books weren't just appearing on our side of the water, because some terrific scholarship, such as this by Wayland Dunaway, the Scotch-Irish of Colonial Pennsylvania, was published in 1944. And so people have been accumulating knowledge over the years. There's a lovely little one here, which American GIs were issued with when they came to our shores in preparation for World War II, a pocket guide to Northern Ireland. And some of it is quite funny. There's a, a advice in here about, uh, about the girls, for example. They were perhaps concerned about romantic opportunities. But there's also a line in here which says, uh, never talk religion or politics. It's in a little chapter called About Arguments. And there's a line here which says, argument for its own sake is a Scotch-Irish speciality. And perhaps it was that sort of attitude that fed into that desire to, to break free from the oppression of the crown and state as it then was, and to eventually become independent. Um, other lovely little pamphlets such as this one here, the Scotch-Irish and Ulster. This one was published by um, a, a man called Eric Montgomery. And for those of you who know the Ulster American Folk Park, Eric Montgomery was one of the founders of it. But on your side of the water in Virginia, um, he was also one of the founders of the Frontier Culture Museum at Stanton in Virginia. And one of its earliest buildings was a stone cottage that was relocated by Eric Montgomery from County Tyrone into Virginia. About 20 years ago, Senator James Webb, also of Virginia, published this very famous book, Born Fighting, How the Scotch-Irish Shaped America. Fighting is not always a good thing. Um, arguing probably is. Fighting not always. Um, it was a very successful book, and I had the privilege of meeting Senator Webb in Washington, D.C., in 2007 at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. But the Ulster Scots, the Scotch-Irish, the Scotch-Irish all exported much more than just fighting. They did, of course, export the ability to display very strong spirits. This is a famous book by Joseph Earl Dabney from, I think, South Carolina, possibly North Carolina, I think South Carolina, and um, all about the Ulster influence on distillation and how bourbon and rye and so on were invented because you didn't have barley, so they had to make use of what crops were available with the same methods. And I'm so delighted that Mary's here because 
This is Mary's book published fairly recently, um, Scotch-Irish Foodways in America, because we also exported food and exported food across there. And if you want to know about potatoes in particular, please get in touch with Mary or even better, buy a copy of her book and you'll find out about the origin of the potato up in New England, a really important story, again, taken across the Atlantic from here. But undergirding all of this, it's ideas because people travel and they take ideas and philosophies and convictions with them as well. Many of these people had been very well schooled in the Bible and they had also learned the traditions of people from Scotland like John Knox or even um, a minister called Samuel Rutherford whose books were burned and in those books in six published in 1644, Samuel Rutherford wrote that all men are created equal. Now you will, those, those words will resonate with a North American audience. These people took those concepts with them across the sea. And the first thing I'd like to show you on my screen is that these aren't just Scotch-Irish people talking to Scotch-Irish people about themselves and how wonderful they are. The whole thing about ideas is that they can be shared. They can be shared outside of one's own community and outside of one's own ethnic group. I'm going to share just now. And this is a graphic from the exhibition, which again, I hope you're able to see. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here because the large portrait in the background is the father of black history, Carter G. Woodson. He had been educated at Berea College in Kentucky. He grew up poor. His parents had been freed slaves and Carter Woodson's neighbors were dirt poor Scotch Irish people. And he wrote in uh, 1916, a marvelous essay, which I would highly recommend to anyone called Freedom and Slavery in Appalachia because he understood that across ethnic lines, he had so much in common with the Scotch-Irish experience. And so I'm going to zoom in now to see this extract from his writing. Our God covenant adhering liberty and tyrant hating race which had formed its ideals under the influence of philosophy of John Calvin, John Knox, Andrew Melville, and George Buchanan. They had been taught to emphasize equality, freedom of conscience, and political liberty. When they demanded liberty for the colonists, they spoke also for the slaves. And there are so many quotes like that in Carter Woodson's writings. There, I would strongly recommend that if you're interested, please do have a look. Often, of course, these things can be about um, people like me, sort of middle-aged, balding, bearded men, and that's quite, quite a restricting, dwindling audience as well. So I'm going to show you a quote this time from a, from a woman, a female author called Willie Walker Caldwell. Now, she was from Virginia, and in 2018, she was added to the Virginia Women's Monuments Glass Wall of Honor in Richmond. And she wrote a, a whole series of books, and one of, who went, one of which, sorry, was a novel in 1918 called Donald McElroy, Scotch Irishman. And Willie Walker Caldwell knew that there was a whole set of other documents that preceded the Declaration of Independence. And as you can see here, this extract um, is how she describes them. These were vehement petitions urging resistance to tyranny sent up to state conventions and the first Congress by the Scotch-Irish counties of Virginia, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. But at the bottom, she laments a little bit, again, I hope you can see this, that sadly these have scarcely been heard of. Because the declaration itself has, has taken so much attention and focus that these predecessor documents have been somewhat uh, forgotten. Now, from, a, from an, an, a, 
a Northern Irish point of view, um, there's also a surprising um, source that I would like to show you. Because in our little sort of narrow confines here, we often think that these stories are restricted to um, the Presbyterian community, the Unionist community, the Protestant community. And that's not the case at all. Because another marvelous quote here from the Irish Republican socialist and nationalist James Connolly, who was involved in the Easter Rising in Dublin in 1916. And James Connolly understood the experiences of the Ulster Presbyterians, which had caused them to need to emigrate and to eventually um, press for independence in America. He wrote this in, in 1913, that for the Presbyterians, the victory at the Boyne simply gave freer hand to their Episcopalian persecutors. In 1704, Derry was rewarded for its heroic defense by being compelled to submit to a test act, which was also enforced all over Ireland. Thus, at one stroke, Presbyterians, Quakers, and all other dissenters were deprived of that which they had imagined they were fighting for at Derry, Ochram, and the boy. So I'm going to turn off my screen share momentarily here. If I can do so. I think the technology is getting in the way here, everyone. I hope you can hear me anyway, if you can't see me. Um, that is good. That is good. Now, I'm not sure if I've managed to turn off screen share, so my apologies if, if not, but I hope you can see me if, if, uh, if not. One of, the, one of the first things I'd like to show you, though, is that in the midst of, of all of this, um, the Scotch-Irish Society of America was founded in um, 1889, and they published a series of marvellous um, books, proceedings of their annual congresses, and they had a terrific logo, which I'm, I'm always been greatly attracted to, and I hope that you can see that, because it, it has a shield with the stars and stripes, it has a red hand of Ulster in the middle and around it, thistles and shamrocks. And at the very top, again, I hope you can see this, is the motto, liberty and law. Because for these people, nationality wasn't really the priority. Nationality was a vehicle for liberty. And when their liberty was at risk, they were willing to overthrow whatever their nationality had previously been. Again, I'm going to show you another piece of um, content from the exhibition. Um, as you enter the exhibition, this is the large message that you see. Voices of the people. The Ulster Scots defense of Londonderry in 1689 secured the glorious revolution and 12 years of liberty for them in an era otherwise marked by government persecution. Soon thousands would leave Ulster for America, fired with a determination never to be deprived of their freedoms again. Their determined voices can be heard through almost a century of community documents, each its own public declaration showing how their views and aspirations paved the way for independence and which connect their grandparents' 1688 revolution with their own 1776 revolution. And at the time, Edmund Burke, one of the greatest thinkers of, of our islands in this era, described these people as, as this. These are chiefly Presbyterians from the northern part of Ireland, who in America are generally called Scotch-Irish. Lots of people think that term Scotch-Irish is, is new. Um, it is, it's not new at all. It's a term of, of great pedigree and, um, and tradition. So I'm going to shut down that, that screen again. And again, I'm still not entirely sure if I've managed to do that successfully, but I hope you can, you can hear me 
If, you can hear your mark, but um, the screen sharing didn't work. The, the screen sharing didn't work at all. That's, um, I apologize. I, I do apologize. That would have been um, a big help to you. So in the exhibition, we have, we have nine documents. Um, they go from Maryland in 1689, where the first settled Ulster Scots community was based at Old Somerset on the eastern shore of Maryland. There was a community there, and they had left Londonderry and Donegal, and they had settled. And when news of the revolution in, in our islands reached them, they published a petition in 1689 in appreciation for the new king and queen having overthrown the previous tyrannical king, who was one of the reasons why they had chosen to emigrate. Um, we then go through to 1718, uh, a famous document that many of you will know, which is the, the shoot petition where again, a, a collection of people, prospective emigrants who had endured the siege of Derry wrote to Governor Samuel Shute, the governor of Massachusetts and New England, um, requesting land and taking up an offer that they would emigrate and join um, the new Massachusetts Bay Colony. Over the years, as tensions started to build, shall we say, these Ulster people turned up with attitudes that uh, maybe weren't quite in keeping with what various governors thought they should have. And I'm going to show, uh, I'm going to try perhaps to show a few of these to you. A Reverend Alexander Craighead, who was from Donegal, made friends with a certain Benjamin Franklin, who was a printer in Philadelphia. And uh, Alexander Craighead was no fan of any monarchy or any authority whatsoever. As far as he was concerned, Christ was the head of the church and that scripture was their only guide and that was all that they needed. In 1743, Benjamin Franklin published a pamphlet by Alexander Craighead, which was the first treatise published in America to denounce the monarch of Great Britain as a tyrant. Now, Alexander Craighead and Benjamin Franklin could probably have been um, imprisoned or worse for publishing that, but it didn't stop them because five years later, another Ulster Presbyterian minister called Gilbert Tennant, who was from Portadown, also emigrated and also made friends with Benjamin Franklin. And uh, in, in, it, in, in his pamphlet, he defended the people's right to take up arms against the tyrannical government. You can imagine the ripples of, of these ideas starting to cause some consternation. And it was um, William Franklin, Benjamin's one, people say, illegitimate son, who uh, 20 years later was governor of New Jersey. And he wrote this, that the Presbyterians of New England have wrote to all their brethren throughout the continent to endeavor to stir up the inhabitants of each colony. And the ripple effect was felt far and wide all the way through the 13 colonies, because right down at the bottom in South Carolina, an Anglican uh, called Charles Wood Mason was, so, was very concerned. He wrote this in 1767, that there were not less than 20 itinerant Presbyterian, Baptist and independent preachers who traverse this country poisoning the minds of the people, instilling democratic and commonwealth principles into their minds that they are a free people. How outrageous was this? How outrageous was this? Many of these people spent evenings at firesides listening to stories from their parents or from their grandparents. A young man called Hugh Williamson was sailing out of Boston on the 16th of December, 1773, bound for London. At that very moment, unknown, unbeknown to him, the Boston Tea Party began. And when he landed in London, he was taken to the Privy Council, one of the, 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 the government authorities, and was questioned on what on earth had happened. Um, Williamson's parents were Ulster immigrants. And Williamson said to the Privy Council, retribution, will bring rebellion. And he was right. And he published a wonderful book called A Plea to the Colonies, or A Plea from the Colonies, in fact, in which he protested at the introduction of laws 
that were crushing what the colonists wanted to achieve in America, and most importantly, the denial of their rights. Because we're obsessed with, with nationality these days, we, we, we get a bit bogged down with terms like, like British, for example. But what they were campaigning for through all these predecessor documents was their full entitlement as British subjects. But the Crown and the government were totally unwilling to grant them those. After the Tea Party, there was a siege of Boston. And in Williamson's document, he says that what they were trying to starve the people out of the city. This is exactly the same as had happened to them in Londonderry in 1689, because in Coleraine, Massachusetts, not Coleraine, Northern Ireland, Coleraine, Massachusetts, the first of a set of these documents appeared called the Coleraine Resolves. And in those, there are references to people remembering that their parents had had to eat rats to survive starvation. Another one I'd like to show you before I play an audio clip is, um, again, I'm going to try the screen share. I'm going to try it and see if it works. Because urban Boston was the epicenter. But a lot of this echoed out and reverberated right out to the edges of the colonies. Can anyone see that, that screen at all? Is that working this time? Maybe, yes, I've got a thumbs up from Stephen. Thank you very much, Stephen. On the 20th of January in 1775, the Presbyterian minister from Donegal called Charles Cummings commandeered a meeting of the local people and they published what became known as the Finn Castle Resolutions. Finn Castle, right down in the bottom of Southwest Virginia. The title there is an extract from it. That those Ulster emigrants who met that night in a tavern owned by James McGavock, who was from Glenarm on the shores of County Antrim, that regardless of what the government and the crown and the state would throw at them, that they were determined never to surrender. And there are so many of these documents, so many of them. Um, a date that resonates with people here is not only the, the 4th of July, but the 12th of July. And on the 12th of July in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, in 1775, there was a meeting there in the Presbyterian Church. And a whole lot of Ulster immigrants met there and issued again a set of results called the Coleraine, or sorry, the Carlisle Resolutions, in which they also said that they were willing to fight for independence to the end. At the bottom of the declaration, there are three names. There are those of the printer, John Dunlap, those of the secretary of the Continental Congress, Charles Thompson, and thirdly, John Hancock, the biggest and most famous of all, perhaps. John Dunlap had been born in Strabane in County Tyrone. Charles Thompson had been born at Upperlands near Mahara in County Londonderry. He also became the designer of the Great Seal of the United States. So for us to have two of those three names as coming from here is very special and is largely why it's so relevant that Prony has an original document on display at the moment. I would like you to hear a piece of audio from the exhibition, um, which is, uh, firstly, we'll listen to John Dunlap, the printer. So fingers crossed, this will work. It is nearly 20 years since I arrived in Philadelphia, a boy of just 10 to work for my uncle. Hard to believe that I used to sleep under his counter. I'm 29 now, and I've earned a reputation as a printer that you can trust. My name is John Dunlap, and I was born in the town of Straban in County Tyrone in 1747. Straban was a fine place to live. But my parents thought America was a land of opportunity. As I myself have come to realize, there's no place in the world where a man meets so rich a reward for good conduct and industry as in America. Just about everyone knows that I was the printer of the Declaration of Independence. I'll never forget that night, the 4th of July, 1776 when I received an urgent order from the Congress to print the declaration. It came in handwritten 
with just the signatures of John Hancock and Charles Thompson on it. The only two signatures I needed to know that it was real. It was a big job. We had to work through the night to get 200 copies printed and ready to go out across all 13 colonies the next morning. It was very risky too. I could have been arrested for high treason, maybe even hanged, but I didn't care. Like most of our people now, I'm all for independence. So I just made sure my name was at the bottom of the declaration for all to see. Printed by John Dunlap. Good day, my friend. There you go. Very emotive stuff. I hope you'll agree. And, uh, and here he is. And that is John Dunlap. And this is from a Library of Congress publication, which shows his broadsides, as they are known. These are the ones that were, that were carefully typeset in the middle of the night and then distributed the next day. There are only about 23, I think, of them left in the world. So it is wonderful that there is one of them in, in Northern Ireland at the moment, courtesy of the National Archives. The other name I mentioned was Charles Thompson. And again, a little less than two minutes video, or audio, sorry, of him bringing his experience to life for you. Welcome to the Pennsylvania State House. My name is Charles Thompson, and I am the Secretary of the Continental Congress. That's me in the big painting, standing behind the table. Today is the 28th of June, 1776, and our committee of five has just presented me with their final draft of the Declaration of Independence. Its wording shaped by the resolves and resolutions published by our people across the 13 colonies. I was born near Mahara in Ulster, 1729, and only nine years old when my father and I set out for America. But he died on the way, so I landed an orphan and ended up working as a blacksmith. I was schooled over here by Francis Allison, a Presbyterian minister who came over from Donegal. He taught so many of us to read and think about liberty for ourselves. I became good friends with Ben Franklin. With revolution in the air, I joined the Sons of Liberty and was made Secretary of the Continental Congress. It's been a long journey for a wee lad from the countryside of Mahara. Congress will meet again on the 4th of July, and we plan to formally adopt the declaration. I'll have to sign it, along with John Hancock, and send it across to John Dunlap's works to be printed and sent out. Tens of thousands of Ulster Scots like me are here. All we wanted was a fair deal from London, but they wouldn't listen. Now we're ready to do whatever it takes. Next step, independence. So for those of you who are able, I would really encourage you to get to, to Prony to, to enjoy the exhibition for yourselves, to see the declaration. And I'd, I'd like to show you this because for those of you who maybe haven't yet um, been on the, the Prony Facebook page or, or their website, this is um, how, let me see, I hope this is working. This is how it's displayed on one portion of the exhibition. So it's in a, in a very, very special museum grade case. Um, you can see Charles Thompson's portrait, I hope, on the left hand side with, uh, with the, the audio headset to listen to him. Um, on the right hand side, there is John Dunlap's portrait and again, where you can listen as well. And this, I, again, I hope you can see this, um, this shows just how close it is possible to get to it. Because to be that close to a document of that historical importance is really quite something. I mean, I, I, I've just got a new shiver up my back at just remembering having seen it. It is truly, truly terrific. But we, 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 we thank Prony so much for the opportunity today, for the exhibition itself, and, uh, and to thank you all for, for tuning in today. We are indeed uh, transatlantic. We have a lot more to share than just food or moonshine or fighting. We have ideas and we have thinking and we have communicating to do. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we're going to pass to Brad in a minute. And before you, um, you go, Mark, 
Well, one of the questions um, that was asked was, could you put the names of some of those books? Maybe in the chat. Now, yeah, I, yeah, know, yeah. I know you showed a lot of books, so I don't, <laughs> I don't want you to. I don't want you to be writing the whole time, but if yeah, you could yeah. just drop a couple in for. Um, I, I, I will do. I will do that. That's great. Okay. And I'm now going to pass over to Brett, who's going to talk about. We've talked about the declaration. Now we're going to look at the sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to this event. And thanks, thanks very much to Mark there for a very, very illuminating talk. I'm sure, I'm sure you all all agree. Uh, this this idea that I had came back from sure, during during kind of lockdown times when I was looking for an idea to get content on online with the help of some colleagues in Prony who were looking to get events going because people weren't we had to start moving things online. And I had an idea about the American Revolutionary War. But I wasn't sure if it'd find anything. But I guess it started with that great sort of opening conversation with yourself. I wonder what we have in Prony. I'm just going to get this ready here. And after a while, it it kind of came good that we we had a few things, and I thought there was enough material to uh, actually go for it and see what we could find. I'm just going to get get this back to start here. So there there we go. So as I say. I did this talk in 2021 when online, because that's all we were really doing at the time, due to various lockdowns and things like that. And it was an educational talk about the American Revolutionary War and about archives that we held in Prony. So I was surprised to find some things. And I'm glad to share it all with, with you here. It was an impressive uh, painting by Emmanuel Lloyds of, of Washington crossing the Delaware, which is always a great, a great image to you. So without further ado, I'm just going to pl ply ahead here. So. Let me see if I can get that down. Mm. So this was an educational talk. I'm sure a lot of people uh, listening to this, watching this talk might know all this, but this was aimed at people as a public history talk back in, I think it was in September 21, who maybe didn't know an awful lot about the American Revolutionary War. So I was trying to get people to set the stage for them to kind of bring them along with various things. And this was the road to revolution, as I called looking at the various acts, the Sugar, you know, Stamp Act, Sugar Act, Townsend Act, you know, how this how this sort of fermented this fervor, this revolutionary kind of spirit that, that led up, that paved the way for the road, road to war. And of course, famously opened up with uh, Lexington uh, in April and then Bunker Hill in June 1775. So I was using sort of PM infographics. We are, don't worry, we are going to be getting on the archives very soon. I'm just setting the scene and I'm just looking at some of the key events of that event. And obviously here on the 4th of July, we're, we're celebrating that with the Declaration of Independence, which... I was a document that really changed the world. Now, we obviously know all this, so I'm just going to skip ahead. So this is one of the first sort of things I found when I was looking. It was an illustration that we had taken on the, on the Boston Tea Party, and that reference INF7B8, that's the, that's the archive reference number. And that was about the, uh, the whole background, the monopoly of these, the company, the free trade being stifled, and then what this act, the Bostonians boarding these ships and these tea chests. So it's a, it's a lovely illustration of that from, from, the, from the time. It's a copy of that that I find in Prony. So that was kind of setting the scene for me to start sort of scratching and look, digging deeper and the same one I can find. There's another lovely color illustration of it as, as well. You see that lovely Boston Harbor there, there in the background and the, the tea getting poured over. It's very sort of, it's very powerful and it's also cartoon-esque, you know, but it's sort of indicating a very serious event. Like what needed Patrick Henry. So Battle of Bunker Hill, with some really fascinating archives about that. So this was 17th June 1775. Uh, technically a defeat to the Americans, but the British suffered greatly at this with a lot of officers being killed, which is one of the reasons that you know they couldn't really afford to replace them so quickly because of the command, because they were coming on. And their red waves, and that's the hard pile uh, painting there. And you can see at the top of that those red formations being killed, trying to trying to get up that hill. And this is a this is a letter I came across. Which is Edward Collins, a general Pomeroy, that's written slightly after the war, and it's uh, it's been sent home. And um, I have a little transcription here of it. More satisfactory account of the situation of affairs here than it is possible my part to give. You beg the liberty to relate some particulars. The engagement with the rebels calling them rebels, so they, they don't, they have this view of them that should be to, you know, the British army should be able to deal with these people very, very easily, but this isn't the case. So what's happened here in the 17th in the Heights of Charleston? 
belonging to a regiment and suffered much and having the honor to command the Lieutenant Colonel's company that day. The rebels were computed to be about 5,000 strong and we not above 2,000. They had the advantage, strong redoubt, an entrenchment, eminence with some cannon. 52nd battalions that I belonged to lost three captains killed on the spot. I'm not troubled with an imperfect account, but it's said that it was at least on our side, thousand killed and, wound, and wounded, 85 of whom were officers. And this line at the end, and this sort of major engagement early on in, in the war, when these troubles will end, God only knows, but is a war that is much to be lamented. So it's kind of a, kind of striking when you are coming across these letters and finding things. So this is a this is another this is a count here of of uh, Bunker Hill as well. And again, going back, these are these are communications going back and saying you know a slightly different spin here from this is from the British side. So this is the sorry, General John Palmer is on the on the British side, but he's based in Britain at this time. Letters are going across. So we gain a complete victory of the rebels at the expense of upwards of 30 officers killed and dead of their wounds, 60 more night wounded. Such another victory would near unhinge our little army. So these doubts are creeping into the sort of previously invincible British army that they aren't dealing with sort of country bumpkins here. They're, they're dealing against an organized force with intent. He goes on to say that the rebels have fortified the high grounds opposite the Austin Charleston and short other rising grounds at different entries into Boston to prevent our penetrating into the country. So it's effectively Bunker Hill's keeping them out. <clears throat> So this is this is office. This is accounts of of uh, dead and wounded officers from the Battle of Bunk Bunker Hill, and it does make quite striking reading to see what casualties they actually were were inflicted upon the the uh, British Army. So again, this is General John Pormeroy, who's in Dublin, and this letter going across to him. and closing a return. So he's getting the official returns. So he's now seeing the official returns rather than just the kind of imperfect accounts of wounded, but they know it's bad. They know Bunker Hill was a victory technically, but it cost them dearly, particularly an officer, as I mentioned earlier. If you please observe letters meant those are dangerously wounded and by little hope of their recovery. By the letter in brackets SDs meant those officers here are since dead of their, their wounds. There is, is so it's quite a it's quite a big a big event. No little illustration like I, I came across in Tony Archives is looking at the kind of the the response to this to uh, Bunker Hill, this massive event in New York. So these warships coming over now on on mass, this massive show of force coming into New York. So it's, you know the primary to establish a base to conduct the war. So Boston, although is a sort of a victory, but a very costly victory, it wasn't strategically important as what New York would would be. So. This is now the British Army doing what the British Army can do, which is a massive amphibious landing operation that the Colonial Army could, could not ever hope to mount. So this is now getting them back in the game, as it were. Mm -hmm. So roughly look at the war strategy. And again, this talk is originally meant as an educational talk for people who didn't know an awful lot about the war. So I do apologize if you know all this, but it's just the British... The war strategy is capture New York, isolate New England. Rhode Island is a base to win war in the north, and the south would fall easily because much of the population is still loyal. This is the thinking where Washington's army has outlast them, just wore them down, play for time. And then, as this we quote the bottom there, we should on all occasions avoid a general action. So just keep grinding them down, just keep wearing away at them. Um, that's that's the way to win. If you go into these major engagements with the, with the British Army, you're probably going to, going to lose. So there's a, a real awareness, and just the two types of strategies being being played out there. That's a lovely, lovely hand, hand drawn campaign map. First more uh, first marks of pasties to Lord Moira. That's the the reference number, and it's a beautiful, beautiful map of that kind of area around Maryland, Pennsylvania, Chesapeake Bay, Virginia, with a major campaign of, of the war. And I, I did, when I did see that for the first time, I was really taken with it because it is, uh, it's quite an accurate little, little map and beautifully drawn. And uh, again, showing you the, the major sort of lines, the major settlements there, the major uh, British army where the major sort of battles were fought, weren't they fought in the far north or the south, it tended to be in that area between Pennsylvania uh, Maryland and Virginia. So we just, uh, Mark had mentioned John Dunlap, and I'm sure we, we heard him talk and uh, his importance to the Declaration of Independence. So soldier and printed the first copy of the Declaration of Independence. Also one of the founder members of the Philadelphia Cavalry throughout the campaign and afterwards in uh, I think the Whiskey Rebellion in the 1790s, he, he was still, he was still involved, still with the Philadelphia Cavalry. And this is this little memorandum here I, I find picks up on this. And this is just taken now after the Revolutionary War. It's not during the war, but Dunlap, a patriot, 
quick, you know, very, very strong in his belief to defend that, and as mentioned here in this quote, in the laws and government of this happy country require defense, the Philadelphia Calvary need but one hour's notice. They're ready to go to defend this at all costs. So I think it's a very telling statement about John Dunlap's, you know, we know him as a printer, but this is the norm as a soldier, you know, as well. So it's a slightly different side to him and his, his enthusiasm and fervor for the revolutionary cause and for the new young nation of the United States of, of America. It's a very telling. Well, again, this is background. It's done that. I'm sure it's been uh, market explained it better than I could, so I don't need to go on that. And we know who he was and his importance to the to the printing, to the cause, to the revolution. And the exhibition in Prony does obviously feature John there, so I don't need to go on that. So this is a this is a surprising little letter. I I came across this, and this was Job Johnson, his brother Robert in County Londonderry. And this is Ulster Scott sort of folk here, and. You know, this is a young kind of soldier fighting for the cause. It came from a country town and uh, Slatterbogie in County Londonderry, and he's off to fight in, in, uh, in this Greece in America, fighting this great war and enthusiasm. It was my it was a quote from the letter here. Letters in very, very poor condition. All the writing's quite clear. You can see there's been damage to the letter over time because it does date from 1784. But again, it was a wee treasure to find this. I was really taken by the content though. So a brief description there was just, or some of the content. It's great joy that I was ordered to Philadelphia to join the army with His Excellency George Washington. He left the Indian country in August, having marched 600 miles to Philadelphia and joined our troops then on the march to Williamsburg. So you can imagine a 600 mile march does not sound like a lot of fun then or now, but it gives us some idea of the, the fervor and the passion and the enthusiasm for the cause. And then the following again, Job Johnson is still writing letters home. Uh, young man, his experience of the war. So this is sort of writes his brother following the conclusion of the war. So this is Job, the letter previously taking up arms, going to fight going to march to join Washington's army 600 miles. And this is after the war race, Deputy Commissioner of the State of Pennsylvania. So pleasure on you this morning, feel of having to the internet, kind Redeemer's goodness, a life like mine prolonged through a long and severe war. The hardships I have been partaker of, but bless God, he has at last given us a victory and established our independence. This is Joe Johnson, Pennsylvania, from Slatterbogie, County Derry. So... It's just that uh, it's nice, nice, nice to find those those little letters because they do they are little like treasure maps. So they do have to contain so first hand to count of something. There's the thing I love about history and archives. It's not that you're just reading something removed from it, someone else has written. You're actually reading what that person felt who was actually there. So it's really powerful. And it does send a shiver down your spine sometimes because it's a, a real way of, of trying to sort of well, what did that feel like? What, what what did that look like? What did that sound like? And that these little letters in these archives do give you a taste. Anyway, it's just some other asides I find here during my collections and, and looking for archives. And you know, it's nice to find first-hand material, but it's not always. You do find some little things that I thought were good. This is a little guidebook to Colonial Williamsburg, which I'm sure isn't particularly rare as an archive. It does contain some lovely, lovely stuff. And I was rather taken with that. Again, Williamsburg, Virginia, very, very important to the American Revolutionary War. Again, the headquarters for Washington and for Lord Cornwallis, so it sort of changed hands. So, the, the, you know, we know it as the capital of the colonial Virginia and Virginia patriots, but it has been has been uh, the, sort of taken by the British for, for a short spell as well. So that's a beautiful little map I came across, uh, again, just not with the, with the various buildings that are really have importance to the actual, to the war. And it's it's a little, it's a, it's a beautiful little uh, map. Oh, yeah, not particularly a rare historical document as such, but but something of interest. And the thing I like about the colonial, one of the aspects I like about that period in America, is I'm interested in kind of as a fan of history, as, a, as you know, as a history student, as it were, sort of the some of the architecture, you know, the Capitol, Williamsburg, the Moore House, and that particular, you know, it's, I love that. I love that architecture. It's something I've always been very drawn to. And you know, these little publications do contain little illustrations of buildings that were very important. This is Lord Dunmore, Gunpowder Incident, famously in April 20th, 1775. This is the militias led by Patrick Henry forced a standoff with British Marines. 
So this is uh, this is by gunpowder uh, gunpowder being removed from the mag magazines. It was a bit of a standoff, so I ended up with Lord Dunmore having to flee Williamsburg for the safety of the Royal Navy ships in the York River. So it's just that little illustration of what that actually looks like. Uh, the courthouse, so famously, a lovely illustration of the Williamsburg courthouse. You know, the, the site where Benjamin Waller read about the United States Declaration of Independence on July 25th, 1776, after it arrived from Philadelphia. So, you know, very, very important little, innocuous little building there. We only have this illustration of it. I came across, but absolutely, fantastically, it's so important to the actual events. Around the Raleigh Tavern, and after Sir Walter Raleigh, another little illustration of that. Meeting place for patriots, legislators, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson met in the Apollo Room as representatives of the people. So again, a place with vast importance to the whole con conflict. So think about research in the American Revolutionary period, the American War of Independence, and sometimes can take you down a few rabbit holes. And I was looking at trades in colonial America. I came across printed documents about that. And I thought, well, I, I, it just became so interesting to me. I never quite understood why, but this was looking at life printer during that time. And we know how important that would be to the actual publication of the Declaration of Independence. And you could spend hours, like a miller, of course, to the lifeblood, to, you know, uh, uh, the craft of, of that was how important that would be for local uh, communities. And then also, curiously, the wig maker, you know, uh, that whole technical in, you know, insight into how this trade was conducted. So I, I just find it fascinating. But it's not all, you know, about the, the guns and the war, the campaigns and the great and the good. Just, I, I'm just fascinated by the ordinary jobs that people did during that, that time. But there we go. So this letter I came across is a copy letter. I can't really see it maybe clearly here, but it's a George, it's a copy letter from George Washington. So I first seen that and I seen the signature at the bottom. I did a double take. I'll just go back there every second. And I did that. There's the Washington signature. So that was something that really absolutely bowled me over when I came across this. This was a copy letter from, from George Washington to the headquarters in Springfield, Massachusetts. So it's concerning the threat of British British fleets off the coast. Uh from, this was from the 20th of June, 1780. So the war not necessarily won, although things are heading in that way at, at that time for the, the Continental Army. So a little, little quote there. The intelligence which you were pleased to communicate to me, you previously transmitted to me by General Foreman from Monmouth. I've not yet learned whether Sir Henry Clinton came with the fleet or whether any of the number of troops or what number of troops were on board. The enemy remained in the same position of points. So there's a bit of, sort of naval military intelligence there, but. You see what Washington is wanting to know is where Sir Henry Clinton is. Is he with the fleet or where is he? Because he seems to be information he would really be keen to have. So it is fascinating to find something like that. So when I think when I came across that letter, that copy of a letter to Washington, uh, from Washington, I thought, I think I can do a talk on this. I think I have enough material to make a talk viable. Because before I wasn't really sure, I was just looking at bits of this and bits of that, thinking it's interesting, but is it, is it enough for a viable talk? Maybe 30, 40 minutes. And then when I find this, I kind of thought, I think it is. So it's the famous painting, which we all know, it's, it's still, still takes your breath away. You see that the, the Delaware, the story behind that is still, it's a beautiful, beautiful image. It really is striking. Even with the texture of the ice, they're breaking through there, it's fantastic. This is a Virginia Revolutionary warm up. This now this was printed so the bicentenary. So this was this was I, uh, it's not an original document from the time, but it's it's taken to celebrate that. But it's a beautiful little thing as well. That's the reference number that we hold in Prony. And again, it, it details a lot of the main actors, the background, the main campaigns, the red and blue, the blue, you know, the main uh, battles fought, marches, campaigns around that area. So it's a really, it's a really lovely little thing to have. Although it's it's a copy printed for a bicentennial commission, so it's it's not a historical document as such in that way, an original archive, but still has a lot of really beautiful information. It's presented in a really fine way, which I really actually clear as well and you see these campaigns going on and again around that we looked earlier at the hand-drawn map of this area in Ch Chesapeake Bay and Philadelphia and uh, Virginia and Maryland that sort of area and uh, the, the kind of key to the whole war really but it's a it's a thing of beauty. Uh, 
touched on earlier on with Washington. I'll look at this now about the Irish makeup of his army, because this so the famous quote, I'll make my stand and for liberty amongst the Scots Irish of my native state, Virginia. So again, it's quoted, often quoted, and you see it, but it's still a very powerful thing. And historians have always kind of debated the Ulsterness, the Irishness, the arms, 20%, 25%. I came across some documents, some reports were saying. You know, the Irish, when we say Irish, we see Ulster Scots and people born in the island of Ireland as well. So the four companies, the 11th Pennsylvania Regiment, the birthplace of the soldiers were recorded. The proportion of these born in Ireland were 65 percent, 58, 55, 40 percent. So that's very, very high. And we don't think all the militia records are kept or are complete, but would certainly in indicate. Here's an example from South Carolina. It's the printed document we have in Crony giving these figures from this and saying, like South Carolina, again, born in Ireland, so we can't go specifically north or south with this at this point, but Captain Heatley's company, 50%, Volunteer Company Rangers, 50%, McLaughlin, uh, second, you know, 43, 40, Captain Purvis Rangers, 50. Again, very, very high numbers. And if that was any indication, which I know maybe it's not of the Revolutionary Army, you could, you know, there, there was a recent historian I, I read, I think it was Patrick Tucker, an American scholar, and he was saying he thinks that Washington's army with an Irish contingent is about 50 percent. It's between 40 and 50. It's not 25. It's much higher. Again, some returns the quote there from Lord Mountjoy, America was lost by Irish em immigrants. So again, some returns of these regiments like Pennsylvania, we know now that we would indicate that would happen also Scots contingent much, much higher due to the levels of immigration going into uh, Pennsylvania area in that particular time before that in that century. So again, that the numbers are much higher, 76 there, you're getting there from, and that would be, would indicate to me anyway, that's more of an ultra Scots, the stronger contingent there. So declaration we know at the expedition of Peronius is some copy uh, documents that came across of it in various guises that, that just record the information the three times, not any of the original printed copies that, are made. So this is a uh, CG York Times, another lovely illustration that came across, and that's the reference number on this British surrender at York Town, 1780-81. Again, you're seeing the war, not peace, not but you're seeing that, that it's especially drawn to an end, even where it, lay, it rumbles on, sort of diplomatically from Volpanti time. So Edmund Burke, what was he saying? The revolutionary made up by chopping and changing about the globe. So this is, this is momentous stuff. So again, you all probably know this, Washington was expenses where he refused them and uh, devalued current war certificates may not be worth what they were. Again, this was just as part of an educational talk about the city of Burke's name wasn't really there at 1800 and Washington of course, died in 1799. So it's another thing. Very, very, very powerful imagery of the Treaty of Paris, power of absence. The, the, the British delegation wouldn't sit for it, but just refused to. So it's less is more. That absence tells volumes about the whole thing. So there's some of the key sources I've used in Prony, the, the hand-drawn camp map, John Dunlap Memorandum, Johnson Family Letter, copy of George Washington Letter, Guide to Colonial Williamsburg, and a copy of the Declaration of Independence, but it's not a proper copy of it. It's a subsequent one. And I came across this little story that... Uh, Copy was actually found in a Scottish castle in, I think it was a couple of years ago. And it went, it was sold, it was a signed copy of the declaration. And it went, sold in the USA for $4,420,000, which is 3.2 million pounds. It was sold it was after being discovered in the attic of a Scottish ancestral home. So I always say check your attic or your spare room because you never know. So just like